Here we go. Good afternoon and welcome to the December 15th Lone Tree City Council meeting. Due to the length of the presentations for the Southwest Village preliminary plan and the master improvements agreement, there is no study session this evening and Council is convening our regular meeting at 4.30 p.m. The first hour of our meeting will consist of our regular agenda items presented by our staff. This will be followed by the staff presentation on the Southwest Village preliminary plan. Following this staff presentation, the meeting will take a 30 minute recess for dinner and then the applicant will present on the Southwest Village preliminary plan and we will also our city attorney will talk to us about our master improvements agreement. After our hearing uh, about the preliminary plan, Council may either act on the plan this evening or choose to continue the topic to our January 5th, 2021 meeting for consideration then. There are no public hearings scheduled for this evening, so the opportunity to provide input to Council will be during our public comment period, and I'll explain how comment may be provided this evening. The Master Improvements Agreement for the Southwest Village is scheduled for public comment at the City Council virtual public hearing on Tuesday, January 5th, 2021 at our 7 p.m. regular time meeting. Meeting access this evening will be conducted virtually and we are holding our meeting electronically in accordance with City Council adopted policy number 20-01. Members of the public must access our meeting via electronic participation. There are three ways to provide public comment during our virtual meetings. Any comments that were submitted in writing prior to our meeting will be forwarded or have been forwarded to the Council and will be included in our official minute meeting minutes. If you would like to type a public comment during the public comment portion of our agenda, click the ask a question in the sidebar of the virtual meeting, enter your name, address, and also provide your written public input. Your name and your comments will be forwarded to City Council and also included in the official meeting minutes. If you would like to speak to Council live using your telephone during our public comment portion, please indicate that in the Ask a Question sidebar box. Submit your name, address, and phone number, and you will receive a call back from the City to provide your public comment via over the phone. All public comments should be directed to City Council, and we ask that you please limit your comments to three minutes. Okay, looks like we are ready to go for our lengthy meeting. I will um, open our regular meeting and ask our city clerk to take the roll. Councilmember Anderson. Present. Carpenter. Present. Shaw. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Brunick. Here. Mayor Malay. Here. We have a quorum. <laughs> All right. I would like to ask everyone to uh, stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. There are no amendments to the agenda. It is adopted as published. Uh, I will pause briefly to allow any council member to identify any conflict of interest. If we don't hear any, we are assuming we are all good. So let me pause briefly. Okay, hearing no one jump in, we are going to move on to our public comment portion. And again, I described the three ways uh, public comment may be provided this evening. Just a quick refresher, any comments submitted in advance will be forwarded to Council and included in the official meeting minutes. Uh, folks can also type their comment now uh, during the public comment period and that, that their written public comment will be provided to City Council and included in the meeting minutes. And once again, there is an opportunity to provide public comment live with a phone call and um, with that period is now open. If you're interested in providing comment, please 
on the sidebar of ask a question, put your name, address, and phone number if you would like a call back to provide your comment live. And while we are waiting to allow folks to connect virtually, I'm going to move on to our announcements for this evening. Um, and again, more information can always be found at the city of Lone Tree .com or Lone Tree Art Center org. COVID community testing at Canvas Credit Union is happening every day from 8 to 4 p.m. through December 30th. Visit the city website for more information and please register in advance. It speeds things up. Virtual Arts in the Afternoon, Happy Birthday Beethoven with Ivy Street Assembly will be happening Wednesday, December 16th at 1.30 p.m. Again, it's a virtual event taking place at the Arts Center, but you'll participate virtually. Schweiger Ranch Holiday Caravan is Saturday, December 19th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. There's lots of fun surprises. It's an opportunity to provide a safe, socially distanced uh, way to celebrate this wonderful holiday season. Live stream at Classic Holiday is happening Sunday, December 20th at 7 p.m. This again is a Lone Tree Arts Center event, but it is happening virtually. City offices will be closed for the Christmas holiday from 12 p.m. on Thursday, December 24th uh, through December 25th. So all day Friday and January 1st for the New Year holiday. Uh, I'm now going to see if anybody has uh, indicated they would like to provide live public comment this evening. Uh, Mr. Rob, anything? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm not seeing any requests for public comments. OK, I, we will. I'll close our public comment portion then and we're going to move on to our consent agenda, which includes minutes of December 1st, 2020 regular meeting claims for the period of November 24th to December 7th and our October 2020 treasurer's report. I will ask for a motion on consent. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes, consent passes unanimously. Moving on to our public works portion, resolution 20-33, excuse me, a resolution approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Lone Tree and Park Meadows Metropolitan District regarding our brick wall engineering study. Justin Schmitz, our public works director, is presenting that this evening. Justin. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and members of City Council. I'm uh, excited tonight to present an IGA for your consideration and uh, this being the first of a long meeting hopefully uh, we can get through this one relatively quickly. We did present this at study session um, and it's a very similar presentation. Uh, if any questions have been cut please let me know. Uh, next slide. Um, so again some simple background. Uh, this project um, is needed and then the reason it's needed is because we do need to complete an engineering study uh, to determine a plan for the repairs and a replacement of the existing brick walls throughout the city. Um, these are city-owned walls that exist mainly within the Park Meadows Metro District. Um, and we had already worked together uh, to get a study done in 2020. Um, and unfortunately, we did have to defer that study due to budget constraints um, as a result of the impacts of COVID. Uh, however, we have been working on an IGA for collaboration between the city and Park Meadows Metro District to complete this study in 2021. Um, the Park Meadows Metro District approved uh, the IGA at their November meeting. Uh, next slide. Again, this IGA is really uh, to break down the different responsibilities for both the Metro District and the city in this partnership project. Um, and really we wanna make sure we get that done so we can move this project forward next year. Um, and a quick summary of that, Park Meadows Metro District um, will oversee the request for proposals or the RFP process. Uh, there was a draft of that RFP included in the packet. Uh, the final version is very close to being complete and, and is being worked out by both teams. Um, we'll also oversee the vendor selection and the contract award. There will be a city representative managed by the Park Meadows Metropolitan District uh, they will manage the project and they have agreed to fund the project costs and have appropriated the full costs in their 2021 budget. Uh, so at this point, there is no funds from the city going in 2021. This will be funded uh, by our great partners at the Park Meadows uh, Metro District. For the city of Lone Tree, uh, city representative again will be assigned to review the proposals and provide recommendations as well as to continue to work throughout the entire project 
to make sure the goals are, uh, of the city are also met. And finally, um, we will be overseeing the public outreach and communication efforts and addressing citizen questions. Uh, this is something that the city uh, of Lone Tree Public Works Department does get questions from time to time uh, from the public about their particular fence. And uh, this study is gonna help us be able to answer a lot of those questions as well as a path forward. Um, and we will be in charge of the public outreach and communications for the project as well, um, which is really important because we are the ones that would deal directly with these residents um, and wanna be responsible for that piece. Of it. In, uh, next slide. Again, uh, sort of the next steps, um, uh, we are requesting a council approval of the IGA at uh, the meeting today. Uh, request for proposals uh, are planned to be due right around the end of the year, December 31st, uh, 2020. That would allow us to get a vendor selected and a contract awarded in January of 2021. And then communication efforts and the project would begin in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, so with that, next slide, uh, really any questions um, on this project or the IGA between the city and Park Meadows Metro District? Thank you, Justin. Um, I'm going to quickly run through council to make sure everyone has opportunity. I will start with Councilmember Carpenter. Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Park Meadows Metro District on um, their, their leadership around this, uh, them being proactive on the management side of it, as well as the funding knowing that we have a difficult budget ahead of us uh, for 2021. So I just want to acknowledge their partnership on this. And uh, thanks for all the hard work and staff to coordinate it as well. Thanks. Councilmember Anderson, any questions, comments? I would just comment that this is a necessary step to get the engineering inputs uh, and appreciate the cooperation with Park Hill Metropolitan District and our good work by uh, Councilman Jay Carpenter to smooth the skids there to make that happen. Uh, important step needs to happen. Look forward to the recommendations later in the year. Thank you, Councilmember Shaw. Uh, it's all been said, thank you. Okay, <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem yeah, no, no question, thank you. Thanks, Kat. My only comment is that in, in review of the IGA, it doesn't specifically uh, ask that um, that a copy of anything be provided to the city. So uh, I know we have great partners in Park Meadows Metro District, so I know they will be providing copy, but just for future, I think we always want to make sure that we request a copy of all the documents that are prepared uh, when we are partnering on a project. And again, extending our uh, gratitude and appreciation to uh, Councilmember Carpenter and to the Park Meadows Metropolitan District, because without them, this project would not be able to move forward in a timely manner. So thank you, Justin, for that. Um, so, uh, next, have a, uh, yep. Motion for your consideration on the next slide. I'll look for the motion. I move to adopt resolution 20-33, a resolution approving the intergovernmental agreement, IGA, between the city of Lone Tree and Park Meadows Metropolitan District regarding a brick wall engineering study. I second. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We have unanimous approval. And again, thanks to all who played an important role in moving this forward and a lot more to come on this topic. So moving on to our administrative matters, we've got resolution 20-34, a resolution adopting the 2021 budget and appropriate appropriating, excuse me, funds. And our finance director, Uli Nearling, is going to be presenting. Uli, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present on the 2021 budget again. Um, this is again a presentation that I have given before on the public hearing in November, so I will be quickly moving through the presentation. Feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation though. Slide please. Our 2021 budget development cycle started in May with council budget session that really focused on policy decisions. Uh, from June through August, city staff then held internal meetings uh, with, with council's di direction um, to prepare a draft budget. Uh, council then met in August again, focusing again on policy decisions specifically around uh, impacts on COVID, of COVID-19 on the 2021 budget, uh, followed by the council work sessions in September, 
We then made a draft available to the public via our website in October. And as I mentioned earlier, we held the public hearing in November. Today we're here uh, for to present the budget to Council for consideration for adoption. And in January, we'll have to finalize the document and file the document with the state by the end of the month. Slide, please. We're listing our six big ideas here because those those uh, ideas really serve as our guiding principles throughout the budget development process. The city has been making investments in those guiding principles in the past, and because of those investments, we have been recognized uh, for accomplishments in all of those six areas. Uh, a couple of examples here are the Altec sensory friendly programs, as well as the Lone Tree Link and the Adaptive Traffic Signal Project. Slide, please. Before we can go into the 2021 um, budget, we do have to recognize that the 2020 calendar year uh, has been an unprecedented year with impacts on both the 2020 budget as well as the 2021 budget. Uh, impacts uh, due to COVID-19 include temporary and permanent store closures, varying capacity levels for businesses, for restaurants, for hotels, uh, as well as events, impacts on consumer confidence, as well as a shift to online shopping. All of those directly affected revenues for the city. Um, with Council's involvement, we were very proactive early on to model the impacts on our revenues and identify early on expense, uh, expense savings as well as expense reductions and cuts, which ultimately ended and resulted in the 2020 budget amendment. Slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Um, in this chart, we're looking at our sales tax collection from 2011 through 2021, and you can see the dr dramatic impact on 2020 as well as 2021, again, due to COVID-19. But I do want to point out to uh, you see a, a steady incline of about 5% from 2011 through 2015, and that trend started to flatten in 2015 on. There's a little bit of an uptake in 2018, which is due to the annexation of the Omni Park area. Um, however, this flattening trend is really creating a long-term challenge as we plan for our future uh, here at the city. And what we've been discussing um, throughout the last months or really the entire year with seeing the impacts of COVID-19, why is the city of Lone Tree seeing more significant impacts than some of our neighboring communities? Slide, please. In this slide, you see that um, our base rate of 1.5% is the lowest in the Denver metro area. The increment of the 0.3125% uh, is pledged towards our uh, bond payment. In addition to having the lowest sales tax rate in the Metro Denver area, uh, we are also very highly dependent on regional spending, where 96% of our shoppers live outside of the city of Lone Tree. And it seems that this high dependency on regional spending um, has a more, or municipalities with a high dependency on regional spending have a higher, have seen more significant impacts uh, throughout this pandemic. Slide, please. What you can see here again, a sales tax rate comparison, but also, um, you know, just a quick summary of different tax types as well as tax bases. So for the city of Lone Tree, in addition, we don't have a property tax. We don't tax food for home consumption. We don't have an occupational privilege tax, which is also referred to as a head tax at times. Um, so some of the other, again, the neighboring municipality that we compare ourselves against to, you see they have much more green check boxes checked here. And we do believe that this diver diversification that some of the neighboring communities have helped them weather this pandemic and show less of an impact than what we have seen in our community. Slide, please. This slide outlines the overview of our 2021 budget, and this is across all of our funds. Our beginning fund balance started at $21.7 million, with total revenues of $31.6 million, total expenditures of $36.9 million, 
and an ending fund balance of $16.4 million. So you, the, the problem here is very apparent where you see expenditures exceed our revenues. Uh, so what is being proposed for the 2021 budget uh, is the use of reserve to, to present that balanced budget that's required. Slide, please. Um, this is just a, a, a quick summary of all of our revenues by source and our two main revenue sources is one taxes, which is in line with other governments. Uh, the second highest uh, revenue source is our intergovernmental agreements and what is included in there are our county sharebacks, partnership funding, etc. Uh, the third highest revenue source is coming from the Arts Center, followed by licenses, fees and charges, franchise fees. The other category um, includes rental income as well as interest income, and then finally fines and forfeitures. Slide, please. As to projections for the 2021 revenues, we included obviously significant decreases in sales tax, lodging tax, admissions tax revenue due to the impacts of the pandemic. Um, in addition to that, we decreased revenues due to permanent store closures and as well as temporary store closures. Um, construction use tax estimates do include um, estimates around the new construction on the east side of Richgate, which is very exciting. And we did include decreases in the highway user tax. Uh, this is from a report that we received from CML that outlined that there's a decrease in this category due to disruptive driving patterns and uncertainty around commuting patterns, again, due to as a result of COVID-19. Slide, please. The intergovernmental, uh, what is also included is intergovernmental revenue and the, in, in the intergovernmental revenue, we listed funding that we received for the design of the acre screen pedestrian bike and bridge design, as well as the I-25 Lincoln interchange design work. What has been added to this list, which is very exciting, and this is a change to the public hearing presentation is the funding that has been made available for the Lincoln Avenue overlaying concrete replacement project. So $500,000 were secured from Park Meadows Metro District, $25,000 from Heritage Hills, and $25,000 from Omni Park. And I mean, this year more than ever, we are so appreciative of those partnerships that help us uh, with, with the Metro Districts again and with the county that help us complete those very important projects. Slide, please. Switching gears over to the expense side. Again, this is just an expense um, demonstration by a broken out by department, starting with the police department, public works, capital outlay, uh, the general government area, sharebacks with the mall, as well as Rampart Range, Metro District, and our debt service payments. Slide, please. Due to the reduced revenue expectations that we addressed uh, in, in the previous slide, we took a multi-phased approach uh, around our 2021 budgeting. And what we started out is with uh, an austerity, austerity budget. So we really just focused on what does it take to keep the city operational and compared that to the revenues, the oper operating revenues, um, looking at purely an austerity budget that we also refer to as a keep the lights on budget. We had a net deficit of about $200,000. Uh, the second step to our budgeting approach in for 2021 then was followed by evaluating and prioritizing expenses related to service levels for our community as well as capital projects. So additional funds were then added to maintain those certain levels for our community. Anything outside of the austerity budget, um, the funding for that was achieved by using our working reserve and funding for capital projects was achieved by using our capital reserve. Uh, Council did not take this decision to use the reserves uh, lightly, but it was recognized again that this was an unprecedented time and that reserves were put in place uh, for, for unanticipated situations like this. Slide please. 
Again, focusing on operating expenses here is it was very important to Council to maintain a high level of service for our community. And that includes in the budget funding for snow removal, for street maintenance, for trash and recycling, as well as community events. In regards to compensation and benefits, um, a new position was added to the 2021 budget, and that is the victim advocate position. 95% of this position uh, is grant funded. So the city is only funding 5% of the position, but gets the full benefit, which is great work on the PD side. The budget does not include merit increases for staff, and uh, the, the uh, city decided to change health insurance vendors um, as of January 2021 which resulted in budget savings to the city, but also to say in savings to the employees and the families. Slide please. So the impact here on the working reserve, again, to fund the, the service level adjustment outside of the austerity budget, as well as that net deficit from the austerity budget, is a net effect of $1.5 million, which would leave us with an ending balance at the end of 2021 of about $3.7 million. Again, the working reserve was established by council for unanticipated situations like this. And due to council's prudent fiscal management in the past, we're now able to use these funds uh, to help us get through this pandemic. The focus in future years will be to rebuild those reserves to previous levels. Slide please. Switching over to capital expenditures. Um, it, it, in terms of the amount of capital projects, it's very few compared, compared to, to previous years. And really the focus on capital projects this year was one, taking a look at projects that are urgent in nature that could um, result in emergency repairs, which, which could become very costly, as well as projects that provided partnership funding. So going through the list here, um, the annual overlay and concrete replacement program for Lincoln Avenue was deferred from 2020 and being picked up in 2021 and now has uh, $550,000 of partnership funding. The Yosemite and County Line Traffic Signal Project was deferred from 2020. Both the Acres Green Pedestrian Bike Bridge design work as well as the I-25 Lincoln Interchange design work um, are bringing partnership funding. Um, the storm drainage repair and study as well as the elevator modernization at, here at the Municipal Building projects, both are to prevent emergency repairs in the future. Um, and the police department vehicles is the purchase of two vehicles that were deferred from 2020 to 2021. Um, we did initially plan for replacing an additional four vehicles in 2021. However, due to the restraints on revenues, uh, that was not possible uh, to recommend. So uh, the final item that we have listed here, the phone system replacement for technology investments. The reason why this project really is on the list is our current system is not supported anymore. We can't get replacement parts. Um, so it, it represents multiple improvements in, in different areas. Uh, one being it's just going to be a better tool for our staff, especially the staff working at home. Slide please. Again, the net impact here on the capital reserve as after looking at all of the capital projects that we just touched on, uh, the net effect is $2.8 million. So we're starting the year with a capital reserve of $9.4 million. We have total recommended capital projects of about $5 million. Other funding sources that help offset those costs total up to $2.2 million. And those funding sources include the partnerships they include, include grants, they include um, excess proceeds from our debt service funds, which will leave us with a proposed ending balance of about $6.6 .6 million at the end of the year. Slide please. This concludes my presentation on the 2021 budget. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions and the following slides uh, provides a suggested motion. Thank you, Uli. And again, I'm going to run through and make sure every council person has the opportunity to comment. Um, 
I think it, it's interesting to note that um, this is the 13th budget that I have been involved with preparing for the city and it was proved the unlucky 13 uh, came to fruition. So uh, I think this is the most important uh, thing we act on as a body uh, for council and I want to just let council know how much I appreciate your time and energy uh, over the course of the last year. I felt like we were doing two budgets in one year with the revisions to 2020 while we were developing the 2021 budget. And we have tremendous staff support. I think we all know one of the great blessings in Lone Tree is our awesome, dedicated, talented staff. But I wanna let the four of you know how much I appreciate the time and energy that you spent on this. Um, and again, very thorough, great presentation, Uli. It's something I think We've been working on since March in one way or another, uh, but I'm going to start with Councilmember Anderson. Any questions or comments? Um, no questions, just a lot of gratitude to our staff for their flexibility and their pivoting during the 2020 to get us to where we were to look at uh, 2021. Um, Yes, it's a conservative budget. It's an austere budget and um, uh, it's very realistic and it, we continue to uh, capitalize the right projects to keep us moving forward. Um, my hope for 2021 is that with the vaccine and moving forward that we find some monies that uh, we didn't necessarily anticipate and we can uh, somehow reward our employees for the hard work and the flexibility and the creativity they showed us this past year. Council Member Shaw. Uh, what what Council Member Anderson said is so true. And in addition, I, I would add gratefulness for the partnerships that the that have been developed over time. Uh, with Park Meadows and the Metropolitan Districts, um, how generous they are to uh, help in this very challenging upcoming year. Um, I, I would love to see us all be pleasantly surprised uh, by, by revenue, but uh, um, I thank staff for listening to our priorities and for um, Manage, managing to um, constrain the needs to just the very um, urgent ones that we have here in the city as long, uh, in addition to city services. Thank you. Councilmember Carpenter. Yeah, I will disagree with you, Mayor, on one piece. It, it, it didn't feel like two years, it felt like five years. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I wanted to, again, just uh, congratulate staff on all their hard work and, and really the ability to be nimble. And I think we were we were really proactive. We were early to the game. I remember those discussions in February of, OK, what are we going to do now, not knowing what March or April or anything was going to look like? So, um, you know, the ability to be flexible and nimble and fluid, uh, I think, is paid off. And here's to hopefully uh, a brighter 2021 for all of us. Amen. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Brunick. Yeah, I agree with everybody. Thanks for all those great comments. And I would just add that um, I think I was most impressed. Uh, I, I remember like Jay sitting in the first meeting, seeing the estimates on revenue being so low and thinking there's no way that that's the way this is going to go in my eternal optimism. And uh, the fact that uh, I think those estimates really positioned us for making good early decisions and certainly I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to staff for their ability to you know, get aggressive in the way that we looked at that in a way that made us uh, able to traverse the entire year and now are ready for 2021. So so like everyone else, great gratitude for the team for their ability to, to lead us through this this phase. And, and really, I think everyone's doing a great job in, in lieu of the very uh, dire situation we find ourselves in. So thank you. Yeah, I think we we accomplished our goal of a conservative and a, I think a fiscally constrained budget. And it's certainly easier to add something back in than to keep cutting and cutting and cutting. So 
Um, and and I really want to echo the gratitude and thanks to the funding partners uh, because our residents aren't going to necessarily feel the impact of this budget very much. Um, we've managed to beg, borrow, and scrape together. We're no borrowing, but managed to 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 you know really um, work, make the most out of the little resources that we did have. And I'm very proud of the fact that our residents are not going to necessarily feel the full impact of the fiscal cuts that happened in our community. Um, I do think that the lack of uh, diversified revenue streams for the city will continue to be a challenge for us. And I think that is going to be the challenge for this council to sit back and really uh, uh, think long and hard about positioning us for continued success. It were it was p prior councils that had the foresight, and I sat on them when we decided to establish uh, uh, policies on our working reserve um, and our capital reserve to weather the storm. And I, I think our intention when we adopted those policies was to never have to weather those storms. Well. We've proven that that isn't the case, and I think this council's job is going to be to position the city for success, you know, five, ten years from now, uh, so the future council can benefit from our foresight. So, with that, I will that long-winded spiel. I will look to uh, council for a motion. I move to adopt resolution 2034 a resolution adopting the 2021 budget and appropriating funds. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, uh, any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. And again, congratulations to council and to staff for a job very, very well done. Um, okay. Usually that's it, guys. Usually you get to leave our dis our second <laughs> meeting in December, but we have got a lot of work ahead of us. So with that, let's move on to resolution 20-35, a resolution amending the city of Lone Tree's admin fee schedule. And we're going to have a presentation from our city clerk, Jay Robb, and Kelly First, community development director. So Jay, are you starting this one? Uh, yes, I am, Mayor. I'm going to get into a couple of administrative fees that we've presented to council in past study sessions uh, and then close with two fees that um, need to be inserted into my section of the, the fee schedule instead of other sections of the city fee schedule. We like to remind council and our residents that the city has um, the rights behind state law and also the home rule charter to impose fees um, to re retrieve the costs of services and just as a reminder, if approved tonight, resolution 20-35 would codify the 2021 city fee schedule, and those fees would go into effect uh, January 1st, 2021. Just gonna start from the top and cover the three types of administrative fees that we've discussed in the past. Um, there are late application fees at the state level, uh, anytime a liquor license lapses beyond its expiration date, and a reissue fee anytime a liquor license holder um, uh, lets their license lapse beyond 90 days uh, of their expiration date. These two fees are assessed um, by the state anytime these instances occur. Um, we would have the option to, uh, to deal with that licensee. Um, we could waive the late application fee um, or uh, exercise both rights to uh, issue the, the $500 late application fee and the reissue fee. Uh, and then we're also asking for the right to um, charge $25 per day for any day um, the license uh, has been expired beyond 90 days. And as I mentioned during the study session, um, we don't anticipate um, uh, using this very often. I, I've never done it in my uh, seven years as a city clerk. Um, we like to kind of just use it as a carrot and stick uh, type philosophy to, as a warning to make sure that we get uh, our liquor licenses renewed. And we're always in communication with our liquor license holders to make sure that happens. Um, besides that, um, I guess I'll just move on to the court ceiling fees. Um, we discussed uh, two other state fees that are in place for sealing um, 
dismissed adult cases and then uh, criminal convictions of adult cases. Um, these uh, are a result of new legislation in 2019 and these are happening at the court uh, district court level and have seeped its their ways into the municipal court level as well. Um, one thing I wanted to clarify from our last study session is that the city prosecutor does use dismissals um, as a tool um, for sentencing to make sure that other sentencing requirements do get completed. So the majority of our dismissed cases are actually um, uh, a plea bargain with the municipal prosecutor um, to, make, to make sure that sentencing gets complete and to avoid a prosecution or a hearing with the municipal judge. There are cases where the city um, may not have a witness show up or a police officer who is testifying may have moved on to another city. And in those cases, the city would uh, incur the court fees um, for that defendant. However, as I mentioned in my staff report, uh, those dismissed cases do leave kind of a carbon copy uh, in someone's um, criminal record that could be seen by a prospective employer. And so sometimes we get cases where uh, past defendants um, need, uh, need those dismissed cases to be sealed and erased from their, uh, from their criminal record because they were not convicted. So um, those are the two court ceiling fees and we'll close with a, a chance for questions here at the end. And then the last two, um, you may remember, uh, we're recommending cleaning and rental fees for the Lone Tree Civic Center. Um, this is, uh, well, COVID kind of raised our awareness on this topic. Um, and we were seeing some cleaning costs that would have to be incurred by the city if groups did use the Civic Center this year or into 2021. Um, we set these rates according to uh, similar rental rates from South Suburban uh, facilities surrounding us. And you can see our two recommendations there, $75 per room for the first hour or less and $100, $120 per room um, basically for a day between four to eight hours at the Civic Center. And um, in a post-COVID world, we'll certainly reassess uh, the Civic Center cleaning and, and rental fees. Two other fees that exist at the city that needed to be shifted under uh, my section of the fee schedule. Um, we weren't really sure where these belonged, and so we made a miscellaneous section under the city clerk fees. Um, when the council adopted ordinance 20-03, it shifted uh, the submittal of special div district service plans um, to my office and um, that fee existed in the community development fees. We just need to shift it under the city clerk admin fees. Anytime a special district submits a plan, a new plan or um, a proposal for a plan amendment that a company is a company with a $2,500 fee, of course, for legal review, I would receive that and then turn it over to the city attorney. Lastly, we're also issuing a $34 recycling cart fee under my section of the fee schedule. Um, this was a proposal from public work staff during the, the 2021 um, public, uh, sorry, budget hearings, and we weren't sure where we should place it in the fee schedule. And so as you can see there, we're asking $34 from residents and the city will pay the other $34. And if approved, that will be included under my section of um, miscellaneous fees. The other public work fees are related to engineering and right of way. And so we thought this was the best section for that. And with that, I'm open to any questions. Thanks, Jay. So before we move on to uh, community development section, I want to just run through council, make sure there's any aren't any questions. I don't think anything is new was presented to us this evening. We've seen it in study session, but let's start. Uh, Councilmember Shaw. I have no questions. Good job, Jay. Count Councilmember Carpenter. No questions for me. Thanks again, Jay. Councilmember Anderson. No questions here. Good job, Jay. Mayor Pretembrenic. No question, thank you. 
and I'm set as well. So why don't we turn over to uh, Kelly first and the Community Development uh, Planning Division fees. Kelly. Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, these fees uh, are proposed specific to uh, what the Planning Division charges for various items. And the intent with this proposal is really to align our fees better with the development processes that we have in our codes and with the actual costs that staff and the city uh, incur relative to the time that we spend and that the, our city attorney spends uh, on these respective projects. The intent is also to improve the transparency and the public understanding of our fees and to uh, try to reduce as much administrative discretion in terms of administering those fees as we can. Next slide, please. So the our fees are basically um, into the following categories, uh, general fees, which apply to, you know, sort of the overarching administrative functions within the planning division. Uh, chapter 16, which is our zoning uh, applications. Chapter 17 pertains to subdivision applications. And then we have kind of another category uh, related to zoning compliance related uh, applications such as temporary use permits. Next slide. So uh, just in summary, um, what we are doing or uh, proposing rather is to include uh, the city attorney estimated fees uh, as applicable um, within our fee structure. Um, and that uh, lends more predictability, we think, um, to our developers uh, so they know what's, what can be expected, uh, as does the city. Um, we would also itemize administrative costs within this, so we would be recouping things like uh, fees for recording certain documents at Douglas County, when there are requirements for mailing certain documents, um, public notice um, publication fees, uh, and those have been typically absorbed by the city, but again, the proposal is to pass those on um, to the applicant. And then we're also proposing new fees for processes that we already have in the code, but were not previously charged or may have been absorbed into just the, the base fee, such as with site improvement plans. Next slide. So um, in summary, um, these are the various application types where we are proposing adjustments to our fees. And um, I know council did receive a presentation from me back in October with some uh, examples of what that really looks like. Um, for the most part, we are proposing uh, adjustments to these fees to try and be a little bit more um, specific in terms of, for example, project size um, as a determinant for what the fee will be. Um, again, going back to how much time staff actually spends on different application types, um, who is spending that time um, in terms of the department and trying to uh, align those costs better with the fees. Um, next slide, please. So the analysis uh, that we conducted as part of this proposal was certainly to review our code and our processes as, uh, along with our existing fees, which by the way, we, we analyzed from time to time, but we really haven't um, um, proposed any amendments for, for several years. So this was a long time in coming. Um, we wanted to develop reasonable estimates of staff review times for each application type, um, review and compare codes and fees from our neighbors in uh, the neighboring jurisdictions just to make sure that we were um, not too far below or too far above um, what other jurisdictions are charging for similar types of applications. And then of course, consultation with our city manager and city attorney's office. Um, I will say from the study session um, that we presented in October, the only change we have proposed is to add uh, a fee for the vacant property registration, which you'll recall is a new uh, program um, that the council uh, approved of uh, just a meeting or so ago. Um, so that $1,000 fee has been added um, to the proposed fee schedule. So in conclusion, uh, we think that the proposed changes will help us reasonably offset our city costs, um, be more clear and less discretionary, and that they are in fact in line with other jurisdictions. I, I do want to note that, um, you know, it's never apples to apples in terms of the types of pro 
project applications that one community um, describes versus another. But um, I can tell you that uh, Lone Tree, in terms of processing time, um, certainly has a reputation for uh, expeditious processing, which we think, you know, of course, time is money, and we like to pride ourselves in actually trying to help applicants as much as possible in getting through the process as quickly as possible. Um, and then finally, uh, we are recommending proposed changes to the planning division fees. Are there any questions? I'll quickly again run through. Uh, Councilmember Carpenter. Nope, no questions for me. Time is money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, Mayor Pro Tem Brunick. <laughs> no questions. Thank you, Kel. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councilmember Shaw. Nothing very clear, Kelly. And Council Member Anderson. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, thanks for uh, making sure that we are expeditious about working with our applicants. And I don't, I don't have any substantive questions. But what, what was making me crazy, uh, Kelly, is where the uh, where in the in the stack report is the new fee for the vacant property? And, and I'm sure it's right in front of my eyes. I just could not find it when I went through the proposed planning. And maybe it's just maybe is it not in? It's because it's not a planning review fee part of the planning review fee schedule. Is it not in this? Was it not included in the staff report? I don't think I included it in the staff report. It should okay. be the schedule itself. That's fine. Um, I just thought I was going to see it there and I didn't. So uh, that, that was a question, but it is there okay. clear clear as day for folks who uh, are, are going to be looking at, at our documents and they will see it, correct? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, no questions on that. Again, we had seen most of it. So I will look for a motion from council. I move to adopt resolution 20-35, a resolution amending the city of Lone Tree administrative fee schedule. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. All right, buckle your seatbelts, everybody. We're starting the, uh, all right, moving now to community development and we are going to start the with 10.1, the Southwest Village Preliminary Plan. Um, Kelly and Kelly First and Roshana Floyd are gonna be presenting to us. I wanna remind anybody that's joining uh, us for our virtual meeting this evening that um, Council will be uh, receiving information, asking questions about this project. We're going to hear our staff presentation first, and then we are going to be taking a 30 minute break to allow for a dinner break, and then we will be returning with the applicant's presentation portion. And again, just to remind anybody joining virtually, Council may either decide to vote on a, the preliminary plan this evening or may continue the matter to January our January 5th council meeting. So with that, we're going to hear from the Lone Tree staff first, and I will again turn it back to Kelly first. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I did just want to take a brief moment tonight uh, to introduce this project before I turn it over to our senior planner, um, Roshana Floyd, for the staff presentation. Um, because this is an important and significant project uh, for the city, this is really the first large scale residential community that's being proposed for the east side of I-25 in the city. Um, it's been a long time in the making in terms of uh, planning and collaboration with our partners at Shea Homes and with Coventry. And so we're, we're very proud of uh, how it's come along and very appreciative of the, the folks who have participated in this planning process, which has been really, um, from the city standpoint, people from across departments, uh, you know, and uh, as well as our agencies like South Suburban um, and others. And of course, um, as I mentioned, the folks from Shea have been really great to work with. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. 
Um, you're going to hear a lot tonight in the presentations about how the project you know, <laughs> conforms with city plans, regulations, you know, technical standards and things like that. But I just wanted to um, let you know that we don't lose sight of the fact that we're planning a community, right? We're planning um, what will be home to future Lone Tree residents. And so we want to ensure that in our planning process, we are always keeping an eye on the fact that, you know, this is going to be um, somewhere that future Lone Tree residents call home and we would want to make sure that they feel um, very happy and proud to live in this community. So I hope that you see that that comes through in a year review of the project. Um, we have been working, as I said, with Shea Homes and with Coventry for over probably two years now. Um, of course, no one predicted um, the year that we would have uh, with COVID and um, challenges to say the least. However, I can say this team did not miss a beat. Um, we have been continuing <coughs> to, uh, to collaborate throughout this entire time remotely, of course, and found ways like this virtual meeting um, to present the information. So it's been really a pleasure, you know, especially during this hard time to look to the future and look to um, better, better times um, coming. So I also want to just quickly acknowledge and appreciate the City Planning Commission who voted unanimously a couple of uh, weeks ago to recommend approval of this preliminary plan. They did just a tremendous job uh, reviewing uh, all of this information as I know that you have been asked to do as well and we so appreciate your time and attention to detail. Um, and then finally, I just want to mention that in addition to our planning staff tonight, we also have um, some folks who you may want to uh, to question or draw upon tonight. Just want you to know that they're available. Our uh, public works director, Justin Schmitz, of course, our city engineer, Jacob James, uh, as well as our chief building official, Matt Archer, are all here tonight in the event that you have questions for them. And then just finally, as Mayor Malay pointed out, um, if you feel as though you, you're just not able to get through this information all in one night or you need more information in order to make a decision, we do have that um, uh, certainly as an alternative to continue uh, this project into your January meeting. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Roshana Floyd. Thank you, Kelly. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Lovely to see you all virtually this evening. Uh, Jay, if you would please advance to the slide that begins with presentation order. Fantastic, thank you. All right, so as Kelly mentioned, the intent of staff's presentation this evening is going to be to keep things fairly high level. Uh, the applicant will follow with their presentation. They will be able to do a deep dive into many of the components of this development. Uh, we don't want to reiterate a large variety of the issues that we discussed and the components that are presented in your staff report. Uh, our intent is just to provide kind of a full overview and refresh everyone's memory as essentially a lead in to the applicant's presentation. So with that said, this evening we're going to talk briefly about what the request is, what regulations and codes we reviewed, a uh, brief summary of the site and development analysis, a uh, brief discussion of some of the constraints and restrictions that you will see on this site. We're going to talk about infrastructure and then we'll give an overview as well of what the next steps for the village will be following preliminary plan approval when we get to that point. Uh, we do have some recommended conditions of approval prepared for you if council gets to a point following the applicant's presentation that you want to make a motion. We have those available and we can review those following the applicant's presentation. Next slide, please, Jay. Fantastic. All right, so here we're going to talk a little bit about the background. Um, this is a momentous occasion, as Kelly mentioned. It's the first preliminary plan application for Ridgegate East. Uh, this application was formally received in July, and as Kelly mentioned, we have been reviewing uh, literally over a thousand pages of various documents and plans as a team. And that brings us to our project summary. Next slide, please, Jay. All right, so 
this site is just under 700 acres. There are over a thousand single family detached lots available. There are also an additional 101 single family detached lots that we are currently identifying as cluster lots. And I do want to make one brief note on these particular lots. As you will see in the applicant's presentation, these lots may be a traditional single family detached home and they also have the possibility of having a variety of a duplex or a triplex format. So for the purposes of the preliminary plan, they have been called out as single family detached lots, but as this development moves through the final plotting process for the subsequent phases, there is a chance that some of those lots may transition into a single family attached tract that could be subject to a site improvement plan, depending on exactly what home type is placed in those specific lots. Uh, with that said, speaking of single family attached, we have seven tracts currently um, with a projected unit count of 959. We have one commercial tract at 13 acres, three neighborhood parks, one school site, one private recreation center, and an estimated population of approximately 5,300 residents. And as proposed, we are looking at five phases. Next slide, please. So what is a preliminary plan? Uh, primarily as an overview for any members of the public and residents joining us this evening. A preliminary plan is the master plan. Uh, it identifies all phases of the development. It is the first step in a two-step process for our residential subdivisions. Uh, the final step will be the final plotting process and or the site improvement plans for those single family attached and for that one commercial tract. Uh, those will both be reviewed against this preliminary plan. And in order to be approved, they must be in substantial compliance with this plan once it is approved by council. Uh, I do want to make one note that single family detached lots will not be subject to the site improvement plan process, just as a reminder. Next slide, please. OK, so our governing regulations and our plans, of course, in the realm of planning, we always start with the big one, the comprehensive plan. From there, we dive into our code, subdivision code being the big one for this development. We also review dedication requirements provided in the annexation agreement. We look at the planned development for Ridgegate, the Sixth Amendment, the sub area plan. That's where a lot of the meat and potatoes, if you will, comes from in terms of community character, street character, open space design, connectivity. Uh, that provides us a lot of that guidance, which is, of course, supplemented by the comprehensive plan and the PDD. And then we also have the Ridgegate East Technical Supplement. Uh, the walk and wheel report as well as the master plan addendum for Ridgegate East from South Suburban Park and Recreation District. So those are just some of the plans that we have deferred to in this months long analysis. Next slide please. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, it's, it was a hefty application, um, but it's good practice because we will be seeing more of these for the east side, which is a very exciting component. Um, just a overview of some of the items that staff reviewed. We have the phase one environmental site assessment that identifies any contamination, pollution in areas uh, like this. That is essentially a just a primary development component, but nothing uh, large or warranted on that particular report. A biological and cultural assessment, geotechnical report, traffic impact studies, drainage reports, utility reports. We look at title reports, easements, preliminary civil engineering, technical supplement amendments, and then of course we have a large variety of agency referrals for this particular project. Um, and that is really where these projects are refined and this plan is refined in kind of that back and forth between yeah. our various agency partners partners. Um, so as Kelly mentioned, not only with our internal city team, but we also have the support and the professional guidance from the city attorney, as well as the surveyor that we have um, on our consulting end as well. Next slide, please. 
All right, so project overview. Uh, again, just to call out, it looks like a lot of pretty colors, um, but what this is telling us is again where our open space tracts are, where our infrastructure tracts are, and the variety of single family attached, commercial, and then the individual residential lots and their placement relative to the road network and relative to the trails network. Um, so I do want to note, as you saw in the staff report as well, that staff did require that retaining walls and the other primary infrastructure component, the detention ponds, that those be called out in separate infrastructure tracts and not as part of a standalone open space tract. And one of the primary reasons for that is to assist in subsequent maintenance agreements. Um, Rampart Range Metro District will be maintaining the larger infrastructure components of this development. There will also be a master homeowners association in place that will also do some of the larger infrastructure pieces. And then within that, there will be smaller neighborhood homeowners associations, and those will govern more of the smaller trail connections as well as some of the smaller landscaped tracts. So that's one of the reasons for this large overview sheet that you have. Uh, next slide, please, Jay. OK, so here again, just a brief overview of the phasing. Uh, so we know how large the development is going to be when it is all said and done, but what, what do we start with? So phase one is identified in green. This is anticipated to be the first build. This will include residential. Uh, it will also include Park B, which we will talk about in a moment. Uh, I do want to note that technically this phase does include the regional park site. That project is a separate project from this Southwest Village plan and so it has a different planning timeline and a different construction schedule. So there is not a guarantee that it will be developed within the phase one timeline. From there, we go on to the light blue. That is phase two. Then we have phase three in pink. You'll see a little bit of a separation for a single family attached tract that is up on Ridgegate Parkway. And then we have in dark blue, phase four. And finally, in orange, we have phase five. Uh, I do want to make one additional note on the school site, which is identified in light blue. That site will be dedicated to the city when that phase is platted. But again, that is a project that is going to have a separate timeline, a separate schedule, and will be something that is not managed directly by the city. So that school development, just for any residents calling in, it is not guaranteed that it will be built within that phase two timeline. All right, next slide, please, Jay. So a brief overview about density and about the populations that we might be seeing in this particular area. Uh, you will see up at the top in the blue table, you have your single family detached and you have your single family attached. So we break those out by units and then we have a multiplier that is associated with that. Uh, that multiplier comes directly from the sub area plan for the East Villages. Um, it has a lot of math calculations behind it relative to the Y's for how that is determined for this particular particular housing type, um, but in the end we wind up with approximately 2100 and change for our unit totals and a population of approximately 5342 residents um, when we have full build out. Now as far as density is concerned, this also is an area where we defer to our sub area plan to make sure that the proposed densities within the preliminary plan align with what has been propo proposed in the sub area plan, um, both from low to medium to high density areas. So here it's broken down again in the green table, phase one through phase five. It shows you the total buildable acreage. Uh, the note on the buildable acreage is that that removes your park area, it removes your open space tracts, so it truly is the area that is available for development for residential development. And then we overlay the proposed units for those particular phases in that acreage, and that brings us to our estimated density. Um, just as a note relative to what we see in Lone Tree currently, 
estimate, and these are, are very broad-based estimates um, because we don't have the full layers in our GIS system that we can quickly calculate yet. Um, but for Ridgegate West, as an example, we have close to 2,213 units. Um, and then we have an approximate residential acreage of between 200 to 250 acres. Again, this is all very large estimating, but that brings us to a slightly higher density than what we're going to see in the Southwest Village. Um, that brings us closer to the seven to eight units per acre density. And then if we're going to look at Lone Tree proper outside of Ridgegate West, um, for there, we're looking at more of a, a density more in line with what we're going to see in the southwest village closer to that six units five units per acre threshold um, currently in old lone tree if you will we have approximately 4457 units just for frame of reference Roshana, it's uh, traditional it's traditional traditional lone tree. traditional <laughs> lone tree thank you mayor I, I will get that and file it away <laughs> uh, may i have the next slide please jay OK, so as I mentioned, we are going to be talking about site analysis and development restrictions. Um, and here you have some photos of the area. So as you can see, there is a stream. Um, this particular site is bordered on both sides by a regulated special flood hazard area. Um, so that actually provides a very nice natural boundary on both sides for this site. Uh, may I have the next slide, please, Jay? OK, so now we're going to talk just again broad strokes because the bulk of this is in the staff report and in the hundreds of pages and all of those previous biological and environmental reports that I discussed earlier. But broad brush, uh, first we look at hazards. So one of the first hazards that we look at, of course, is the FEMA special flood hazard area. So as I mentioned, this site is bordered on both sides by those areas but that is not impacting the developable residential areas um, that we're looking at for the actual home sites. We do have some jurisdictional waters that have been identified on this site. Um, those will require updates from the Army Corps of Engineers every five years. They already have current letters in place. Um, so that again is in development of this size. There are some additional task items that are just part of the business plan for these developments and that is one of them. We also have uh, wildfire zones in this particular area. If you look at the Douglas County Hazard Mitigation Plan, this area of Lone Tree is yellow with a splash of orange. That is common for uh, basically, as we know, um, almost all of Colorado. So nothing unusual there. It is just something that is part and parcel of what we review and what we mitigate for. So this applicant was required to submit a wildfire mitigation plan and city staff worked with the applicant as well as with South Metro Fire and the Douglas County Wildfire Mitigation Specialist on some additional mitigation measures that they were able to include in that plan to address some of those concerns. Um, there is also a Parker Water and Sanitation District infrastructure tract that you will note at the southern boundary of the preliminary planning area that is adjacent essentially to the east-west Douglas County Regional Trail connection and um, as the applicant can discuss in further detail there is the possibility for some additional underground water storage um, so there are a number of aspects that will provide additional supplements in wildfire mitigation as this particular development continues. Uh, the city also consulted with the Colorado Geological Survey in reviewing the geotechnical reports to review the various erosion risks. Again, taking this plan and its development reports up against what we have for the hazard mitigation plan, uh, as well as for our technical requirements for those. So that had an additional level of professional review on that. When we come to the land site, I mentioned the jurisdictional waters of the United States. We also have some expansive soils uh, also 
fairly common for this area of Colorado, uh, just something that we plan with that in mind. So regarding drainage and some of the other items that we may see on this development due to topography, um, drainage components will be handled in, in two ways, and I'm going to again provide a very quick summary, but we do have staff members on the call who can provide additional detail on these if there are additional questions. But we have the grading erosion sediment control permit that happens essentially at the initial part of the development. That's one way that we mitigate uh, erosion and drainage issues. And then that is actually followed up uh, at the per lot phase where we're actually looking at building permits where we have the drainage and erosion and sediment control permit and that's handled with our building department. Um, so there are really two steps to address that component and to mitigate that issue as well. And so now we will move on to cultural and natural and wildlife resources, which is another important component of this particular development and part of our review. Uh, there are cultural artifacts. Uh, that were identified in this site in the biological and cultural report and you will see on this plan that staff did request a note be placed on the preliminary plan uh, the applicant can speak more to their process when they come across those uh, artifacts but they do have a plan in place and that is something that has been addressed in the plan that they will will be required to stick to that plan that they have in place uh, we do have, as you saw in the reporting and in the supplemental materials in your packets, uh, we do have a bald eagle nest that is active, that is on site. Um, they have acquired a no-taking permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so that's one level of our review. And then you will note that there is also a recommendation for monitoring that eagle nest site. And so you will see in the staff report, um, we have essentially two layers of review. We have the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is federal, and then we have the state Colorado Division of Wildlife. Staff is re recommending in our condition for approval that the monitoring of this site be in collaboration primarily with the Colorado Division of Wildlife as the local agency that can be more responsive. Uh, and in addition to that, the Colorado Division of Wildlife is the agency that is referenced in the city's comprehensive plan for uh, managing our wildlife habitat areas and it is also referenced in the PDD for Ridgegate East for the Sixth Amendment as well as in the sub area plan for the East Villages. So that aligns nicely by having that connectivity of agency review. Uh, and then with that said, we also do have some burrowing owls on site. Again, something that is very common to development in this area of Lone Tree and this area of Colorado. Um, we have a note on the preliminary plan for that. That is something that developers in this area are very familiar with. And that is kind of tied in to um, prairie dogs as well. And so those will be addressed and reviewed at the time of development when we actually get into grading. Um, but that's a standard part of, of their preliminary prep and development processes. So with that, may I have the next slide, please? All right, now we're going to talk about development analysis. Again, staff is not going to go too far into the weeds on this um, because we review these components, but the applicant is better positioned to speak to the whys and the hows of these particular components. May I have the next slide, please? All right, so we're just going to provide a, a brief overview again of the site so that you can see this is from the sub area plan. So this outlined where you were going to have your commercial tracks located close to Ridgegate Parkway and then you slowly step down into your medium to high density residential and then into your lower residential and then it calls out the open space areas. Um, so very few changes in the existing preliminary plan relative to that proposed in the sub area plan. Uh, those changes are we have a couple of commercial sites that have been removed 
um, and we have the village park site that is not present in this preliminary plan. It has been supplemented with a large open space trail system and then of course the adjacency to the regional park um, and then you saw in the preliminary plan the school site shifted slightly um, but no drastic changes between the sub area plan and this preliminary plan. Next slide please. All right, so again, just a, a brief overview. We saw this previously. I called out the infrastructure tracks. Um, I discussed briefly the retaining walls and the detention ponds and the reasoning behind staff requiring that those infrastructure components be retained in separate tracks for maintenance, uh, ease of maintenance, if you will. Um, and then I did want to note also relative to the school site that the applicant as well as staff have been in communications with Douglas County School District and this site has already undergone their preliminary engineering process and review and this site does meet their conditional approval. Um, basically conditional approval is all that they are able to provide until they are truly ready to build a school which is likely years out. Uh, but the benefit to this particular site relative to its location is that it is adjacent to what will be an exist, oh, I should say a future detention pond that they will be able to utilize for their stormwater detention. And then it is also adjacent to Park A, which will allow them to have joint use of some practice field areas as well as some playground areas. So uh, a very nice co-location in that regard. Next slide, please. All right, so we do have some proposed development variations that are presented in this preliminary plan. Again, we will allow the applicant to go into full detail on these. This is just a brief overview. The sub area plan per section 1.2, it does permit variations to some of the components within the sub area plan. Uh, and that variation note is very important. It is not a variance like you are familiar with in our standard code. This is essentially a slight change to the sub area plan as approved. And these variations cover two primary components. They cover accessory dwelling units and some slight variations to where an entry can be located, to what the height of an accessory dwelling unit might be and to what their total size may be. And then some variations for setbacks as well. Um, so in certain areas of the development, they are proposing a slight reduction in some of these setbacks, specifically the interior side setbacks. Um, in terms of the area to which this will apply when you're looking at the total subdivision, the setback for interior side setbacks will apply to approximately 30% of the development, just to give you an understanding of the scope of these variations. Um, and then there are a couple of, well, I should say a few non-traditional lots that exist in the development, and they are proposing a variation to some of those setbacks as well that they will discuss in further detail. Um, those are also called out in your supplemental packet that was part of your binder for this meeting. But again, a very limited amount. It's not going to impact a large area in the development, uh, and there will be director approval that will be associated with some of those non-traditional lots. May I have the next slide, please? OK, so a brief overview of parks, open space, and trails. Um, <clears throat> Important to point out for this preliminary plan and this development of the village, uh, we reviewed the preliminary plan here this evening. There is also a separate application process for a master park plan um, that will be coming to you at a later date. That is in the earlier processes. It has gone through uh, informational meetings with Planning Commission as well as an informational meeting with the Recreation, or I'm sorry, with the South Suburban Park Recreation District Board, and then it has been approved by the Recreation Advisory Committee. So it will be coming to you soon, um, but for all of those reasons, we will not be doing a deep dive into to the specific programming of the neighborhood parks when we talk about them this evening. So overview of what the preliminary plan is bringing to you in terms of park acreage. There is the regional park. Um, that is not a requirement of this particular preliminary plan itself. It is a separate project, but it is within this land area and it will be adjacent to the Southwest Village. Then we have three neighborhood parks. 
Um, I want to point out it is very important to note that the dedication requirements for our neighborhood park area comes directly from the sub area plan. Um, it is a percentage essentially of population. That's why we calculate the population, one of many reasons. And for this particular development, 26.71 uh, acres of neighborhood parks are required. The developer is providing 27.86 acres above their minimum requirement. And then additionally, they have been provided with a three quarter acre uh, credit essentially for the private recreation and amenity, cent amenity center. So their total parkland dedication for this particular project comes in at over 28 acres. Um, then I do want to note we have over 200 acres of publicly accessible open space in this particular development alone. Uh, the annexation agreement for Ridgegate East requires 404 acres of open space and this this has met that contribution by by over half uh, and we have a number of villages still to come so that gives you an understanding of what this plan is providing as far as that dedication and then we have over six miles of publicly accessible trails that are proposed as well so we will review those in just a minute and then as i mentioned there is a private recreation center proposed also may i have the next slide please OK, so just a brief overview. Um, this particular slide shows you the trail connectivity and the proposed trail surface as well as maintenance uh, that is proposed for the variety of trails. Uh, I will note there is an update to that overlook point. This was a new development following discussion from Planning Commission and the Recreation Advisory Committee, um, but we now will have, as proposed, a looped trail that will go up to that overlook point. Uh, so that is an additional item to note. Um, the important part of this trail overview is just to discuss the connectivity that this trail system will provide for the future residents. It will provide connectivity to the county east-west trail. It will provide connectivity to the RTD station, to Schweiger Ranch, and then it will also provide connectivity to the future city center and to future commercial and residential development that will occur north of Ridge. Gate. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? All right, so we are going to talk briefly about transportation. Um, this plan is guided, of course, by the city's master transportation plan, by the sub area plan, as well as by the technical supplement that I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. This slide will show you just a, a brief overview of what that road network looks like and it will call out specifically what each segment of that roadway looks like. So for anyone at home following along in the full packet, um, this is going to be followed directly by two pages that show you individual cross sections for each street. So you can see exactly how wide the street is, if it's going to include parking, how wide the sidewalk is, if there's going to be a tree lawn. Um, you do see several areas that are called out in yellow. Um, there are private alleyways here that have been indicated. Um, these have been vetted by our public works team. Uh, I believe there may be a couple of small changes to the color call out for some of these um, as they may not be full traditional private alleys. They may be driveways. Um, I will let the applicant respond to that when we get to his presentation, but just to let you know that um, there may be a slight change to that one. Uh, next slide, please. All right, just a, a brief overview of what a typical collector street is anticipated to look like. Uh, on the left, you see section CC. That is directly from the pre preliminary plan. That gives you your engineering basics. And then on the right, you see um, more of a conceptual of what that truly will look like once the tree lawn is in. And that is directly from the sub area plan. Next slide, please. Uh, and then this is a typical local street. Um, this conceptual, not as pretty as the sub area plan, um, but this is 
this is what free free software will do for planners. Um, so this is section BB, typical local street as proposed by, by the preliminary plan, and then an idea of what it might look like uh, in form once we have homes next to it. All right, next slide, please. So just to, to wind out uh, an overview of what our process has been. Um, we had an initial 35 day referral period for our agencies. We sent this out on referral to over 40 agencies and we received 27 responses from agencies um, as well as two responses from residents. Uh, that resulted in actually ended up being four resubmittals because we did have a resubmittal on one of the ADU variation packets. Um, and then from there, as we refine this plan through the process, we wind up with a project of this size with some items that still need to be looked at. And so you will see those in the conditions of approval when we get to that point. Um, <clears throat> and then may I have the next slide, please? All right, so just to round it out with staff findings, uh, we find that the preliminary plan is in general conformance with the comprehensive plan with chapter 17, with the plan development district, and with the sub area plan for the East Villages. Um, it has been a long review process. It has included, as we mentioned, a number of agencies to review this, um, but it, it has been a process that has resulted in, we believe, a plan that comes close to giving you essentially a full checklist from the comp plan and the PDD and the sub area plan um, that that we could provide to you. So with that said, uh, I, Jay, Mayor, I will stand for questions if there are any of staff or if those need to be deferred until the end of the applicant's presentation, we can do it at that time. But that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Roshana. I am going to ask that we wait to hold questions unless there is just a clarifying question about something that was said in the presentation that any of the council members wants to understand or uh, just make sure they're understanding correctly. So council, is there anything? Um, I think it's better to hold to hear the full breadth of the presentation for any of the specific details, but if there's a clarifying question for uh, Roshana, let's hear it, folks. No questions for me. Okay. None no. for me either yet. Okay. Um, Great. Good. Okay. Well, then uh, look at you finishing right at six o'clock. Wow. Like that was planned. Um,